All right, hello. Went up like a part seven of the I think it's a third chapter. It was like this. He went up to the main desk, in the children's library, taking the train of thought the curfew sign had begun. As easily as the dog shakes water after a swim. Hello Benny. Mrs. Stuart said, like, like Mrs. Douglas at school, she generally li liked them. Grown ups, especially those who sometimes needed to discipline children as part of their job, generally liked him because he was polite, soft spoken, helpful. Sometimes even funny in a very quiet way. These were all the same reasons most kids thought he was a puke. You tired of summer vacation yet? Ben smiled. He was, this was a standard witticism with Mrs. Storrett. Not yet, he said. Since summer vacation only been going on, he looked at his watch. One hour and 70 minutes. Give me another hour. Mrs. Starrett laughed, covering her mouth so it wouldn't be too loud. He asked Ben if he wanted to sign up for the summer reading program, and Ben said he did. She gave him a map of the United States, and Ben thanked her very much. He wandered off into the stacks, pulling a book here and there, looking at it, putting it back, choosing books was a serious business. You had to be careful. If you were a grown-up, you could have as many as you wanted. But kids, you can only take out three at a time. If you picked a dude, you were stuck with it. He finally picked out his three, Bulldozer, the Black Stallion, and one that was sort of a shot in the dark, a book called Quadrat by a man named Henry Gregor Felsen. You might not like this one, Mrs. Starr remarked, stamping the book. It's extremely bloody, and I urge it on the teenagers, especially the ones who just got their driving licenses, because it gives them something to think about. I imagine it slows some of them down for a whole week. Well, I give that a whirl, Ben said, and took his book over to one of the tables away from Pooh's corner, where Big Billy God Groove was in the process of giving a double dose of Dickens to a troll under the bridge. He worked on Hot Rod for a while, and it was not too shabby, not too shabby at all. It was about a kid who was a really great driver, driver, but there was a there was this party pooper cop who was always trying to slow him down. Ben found out there were no speed limits in town in Iowa. Ben found out there were no speed no speed limits in Iowa, where the book was set. That was sort of cool. He looked up after trick chapters and his eye was caught by a brand new display, the poster on the top. The 
poster on top. The library was Duke Hall of posters, all right. Showed a happy mailman delivering a letter to a happy kid. Libraries are for writing too, the poster said. Why not write a print today? Eyes are guaranteed. You need the poster where slots filled. Slots filled. You need the posters where, where slots filled with pre stamped postcards, pre stamped envelopes, and stationery with the drawing of the Derry Public Library on top of the ink. The pre stamped envelopes were a nickel each. Postcards, three cents. The paper was two sheets for a penny. When I felt in his pocket, the remaining four cents of his bottle money was still there. He marked his place in Hogwarts and went back to the desk. May I have one of those postcards, please? Certainly, Ben. Always. Mrs. Torrett was charmed by his grave politeness and a little sudden by his size. Her mother, her mother would have said the boy was in his grave with a knife and a fork. She gave him the card and watched him go back to his seat. It was a table that could sit six, but Ben was the only one there. She, was, she had never seen Ben with any of the other boys. It was too bad because she believed Ben Hanscom had treasures buried inside. He will yield them up to a kind of patient prospector if one ever came along. <laughs> then took out his bell point pen, ball point pen, clicked the point down, and addressed the car simply enough Miss Beverly Marsh, Lower Main Street, Derry, Maine, on two. He did not know the exact number of her building, but his mama had told him that most of most postmen had a pretty good idea of who their customers were once they had been on their beats a little while. If the postman who had lower Main Street could, deli could deliver this car, part, that would be great. If not, he will just go to the dead letters office and he will be out three cents. It will certainly never come back to him because he had no intentions of putting his name and address on it. Carrying the car with the address turned inward, he was taking no chances even though he didn't see anyone he recognized it. He got a few square slips of paper from the wooden box by the car file. He took this back his seat and began to scribble, to cross out, and then to scribble again. During the last week of school before exams, they had been reading and writing haiku in English class. Haiku was a Japanese form of, po form of poetry, brief discipline. A haiku, Mrs. Douglas said, could be just 17 syllables long. No more, no less. It usually concentrated on one clear image which was linked to one specific emotion, sadness, joy, nostalgia, happiness, love. He had been utterly charmed by the concept. He enjoyed his English class, although my, although my enjoyment was generally as far as it went. He could do the work, but as a rule, there was nothing in it which gripped him. Yet there was something in the concept of haiku that fired his imagination. The idea made him, made him feel happy, the way Mrs. Story's explanation of the greenhouse effect had made him happy. Haiku was good poetry, before because it was structured poetry. There were no secret rules. Seventeen syllables, one image linked to one emotion, and you were out. Bingo. It was clean. It was utilitarian. It was entirely contained within and dependent and dependent upon its own rules. He even liked the word itself, a slide of air broken as if along a dotted line by decay sound. At the very back 
of your mouth. I could. Her hair is out. And saw her, do saw her do going down the school steps again with, with it bouncing on her shoulders. The sun did not so much glint on it as seem to burn within it. Working carefully over a 20 minute period with one break to go back and get more work slips, tracking out words that were too long, charging the legend, then came up with this. Your hair is winter fire, January embers. My hair burns there too. He wasn't crazy about it, but it was the best he could do. He was afraid that if he freaked around with it too long, worried to worried it too much, he would end up by uh, getting the jitters and doing something much worse or doing nothing at all. Or not doing it at all. He didn't want that to happen. The moment she had taken to speak to him had been a striking moment for Ben. He wanted to mark it in, her, in his memory. Probably Beverly had a crush on some bigger boy, a 6th or maybe 7th grader. And she would think that maybe that boy has sent the haiku. That will make her happy. And so the day she got it will be marked in her memory. And although she will never know it, uh, and although she will never know it had been Ben Hanscom who marked it, marked it for her. That was alright. He will know. He will know. He copied his complete poem onto the back of the postcard, printing in block letters, as if copying out a ransom note rather than a love poem. Clip his poem, <laughs> clip his pen back into his pocket and stuck the card in the back of a hot drive of hot drive he got up then and said goodbye to Mrs. Torrid on his way out goodbye Ben, Mrs. Torrid said enjoy your summer vacation but don't forget about the curfew I won't he strolled through the glass in passageway between the two buildings, enjoying the heat there. Greenhouse effect, he thought, smugly, followed by the cool of the adult library. The old, an old man was reading the news in one of the ancient, comfortably stuffed, comfortably overstuffed chairs in the reading room alcove. The headlines just below the Mast head blazed. Jules pledged US troops to all US troops to help Lebanon if needed. There was also a photo of Hike, Ike, shaking hands with an Arab in the Rose Garden. Ben's mama said that when the country elected Hubert Humphrey president in 1960, maybe things will get moving again. Ben was vaguely aware that there was something called a recession going on, and his mama was afraid he might get laid off. A smaller headline on the bottom half of page one, one read, Police Hunt for Psychopath goes on, then pushed open the library big front door and stepped out. There was a mailbox at the foot of the walk. Ben fished the postcard from his, from the back of the book and mailed it. He felt his heartbeat speed up a little as it slipped out of his fingers. What if she knows it's me somehow? Don't be a stoop. He responded a little alarmed at how exciting the idea seemed to him. He walked off up Kansas Street, hardly aware of where he was going and not caring at all. Not caring at all. A fantasy had begun to form in his mind. In it, Beverly Marsh walked up to him. 
Her gray green eyes, white, her auburn hair tied back in a ponytail. I want to ask you a question, man. This make believe girl said in his mind. And you've got the strategy to challenge it. He held up a post girl. Did you write did you write this? This was a terrible fantasy. <laughs> it was a wonderful fantasy. He wanted it to stop. He didn't want it to ever stop. His face was, his face was starting to burn again. Ben walked and dreamed and shifted his library books from one arm to the other and began to whistle. You probably think I'm horrible, Beverly said. You, you probably think I'm horrible, Beverly said. But I think I want to kiss you. Her lips parted slightly. Ben's own lips were suddenly to try to whistle. <laughs> I think I want you. He whispered. I think I want you to. He whispered and smiled. A dopey, dizzy, and absolutely beautiful grin. If he had looked down at the sidewalk just then, he would he would have seen that three other shadows had grown around his own. If he had been listening, he would have heard the sound of Victor of Victor's cleats as he, Belk, and Harry closed in. But he neither. But he neither heard nor saw. Ben was far away, feeling Beverly's lips slip softly against his mouth, raising his timid hands to touch the dim Irish fire of her hair. <laughs>